and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and start right on time. Thank you so much for coming at 7 o'clock. We're trying this new time and see how it works. Uh, I'm Fred Bologna, president of the Carmel Residents Association. First of all, I'd like you to thank Barry and Kathleen Swift for providing you with refreshments as you came in. Thank you very much. Um, we always give a little gift for our guests. We have two copies of Stories of Old Carmel. Now, some of you have these on your chair, and some of you have numbers written on the back. So I'm going to call two numbers, and if you happen to have that number, you will be a winner of Stories of Old Carmel. So the first number is number six. Number six. Now, for the second and final number, number 18. Okay, Are they in the back? Another number because she's probably the one we'll know if we see him. Number 15. Number 15. Okay, we'll try. You have it? Zero. I wrote it down. Don't give it to me. I need to see your vaccination card. I'm sure you don't have one. Um, no 15. How about number 10? Yay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, now, um, if you are not a member, there are envelopes on the table over there against the side wall in case you'd like to become a member, it gives you a way to join. And the Carmel Residents Association is committed to the protection and enrichment of the traditional quality of life in Carmel by the sea and the preservation of its heritage and natural beauty through education, community service, community activities, and advocacy. And tonight, we're using education and community activities as well as advocacy with our presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce our board members, and I'll just say all their names because some are not here, just so you'll know who's on the board of directors. Janine Shigra, Frankie Laney, who's right out there at the door, Cindy Loy, Ann Nelson, Tom Parks, who was home recovering from surgery, Graham Robertson, somewhere over there, thank you, Nancy Toomey, Tim Toomey in the back, Sherry Williams, you're somewhere, I saw you. Ken White and John Wolf. that's our board of directors. And they do quite a bit of work for Carmel. Tonight, we have a special presentation by Brandon Swanson, Carmel City Planning Director on the future of architecture in Carmel. Now, Brandon Swanson was raised, born and raised in Eastern Washington State, just north of Spokane. Brandon graduated from Washington State University with a bachelor's degree in hospitality business management, which, um, which brought him and his girlfriend at the time, Carolyn, to Pacific Row for a job at Pebble Beach Company. And yes, Carolyn is now his wife. <laughs> so just wanted you to understand that. After one year as housekeeping manager, as housekeeping manager, Brandon moved into the Capital Improvement and Development Department for the company and discovered his passion for thoughtful land use and project management. In the subsequent years, Brandon worked at the Naval Postgraduate School, school as a project manager and went back to school and obtained a graduate degree in community 
and Urban Planning from North Arizona University. And immediately before coming to the city of Carmel by the sea, he spent several years managing the planning department at the county of Monterey. Brandon has been with the city of Carmel since January of 2021, and with his background in both hospitality and planning, brings a customer service focused approach to local government and his service of Carmel residents. When he's not at hard working to protect the character of the village, Brandon enjoys playing guitar and singing, taiko drumming, and not at home, he does not practice at home, uh, hiking and spending as much time with his wife and 10 year old daughter, Dorothy. So, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, well, I want to thank, and everybody can hear me okay. I'm a little higher up in this microphone than most people would be, so um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, I want to thank you know, the board um, and everyone here at the CRA for having me tonight. Uh, it's a real honor to be here with you. A uh, special shout out to my pal Nancy here uh, for helping me pull together you know, what, what we thought would be a nice program for this evening. Um, and so just early on, just wanna thank you all for having me here. It's been great the last year plus to be, become part of this community. I've been in Pacific Grove for 17 years, so I'm really familiar with Carmel-by-the-Sea. When I was going through my job interview, uh, I used words like magic and things like that because this place <laughs> is magic to my family and I. This is. You know, where I bought my wife's engagement ring, it's I bring my daughter here to the Bach Festival, uh, I come here shopping, it's where we spend a lot of our extra dollars on dining and things like that. So this place has always been really special to me, so it was a pretty easy decision when I got the offer uh, to come here from the county. So thank you for having me this evening. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to talk very slowly. Well, <laughs> let me just do this. All right. Okay, so next slide, please. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So, uh, like I always, I always like to do this for presentations, just kind of tell you what I'm going to tell you in the front so you can understand where we're going with this thing. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you what is community planning and building, or what is, and what is it that we do. Uh, then we'll talk about some recent, recent state housing legislation, really exciting stuff. Uh, I'll try not to put you to sleep with that one. <laughs> ADUs and junior accessory dwelling units, we'll talk a little bit about that. The design review and planning permit process, this is how the sausage gets made. And then uh, Design Traditions 1.5 project, this is uh, the thing that we're working with Winter and Company on, so we'll talk about that. And then we'll have a Q&A session. I will ask you all a lot of questions and you will hopefully have answers. <laughs> um, before we move on, I just want to note, I mean, Nancy was kind enough to, to put together a little program for this and it was called, uh, you know, the future of architecture. We'll, we'll, we'll dance around architecture a little bit, but I just, you probably saw from the agenda, it's not really a solely focused on architecture conversation because it wouldn't be a very robust conversation. Uh, so we'll dance around that a little bit. So going to the first slide here, what is community planning and building? Um, and I just have little title slides here, Nancy, so you can, you can blast past those things. So planning and building, community planning and building really provides three main services for the village. And, and everything that I do in my life as a planner and as a public servant, I come back to service. Like, what are we here for? What are we here for? We're here to serve. We have a monopoly on the services that we provide to the city. There's no place else you can go to get a permit. You can't go to Walmart down the street and get a permit. So you have to come and see us. So we should give you the best service possible and we should take care of the village because there's nowhere else you can go to talk to and say, hey, something's going on down here. We're the only shop in town. So we need to provide the best possible customer service. So these are the three main services that we provide to the village. The first one is planning. Planners guide the design and land use permitting process. This is everything from a fence to a total demo rebuild. They guide that through the whole process, and we'll get a little bit more into that later. Uh, they plan for the future of the village. So a lot of people think about planning, and I think initially they think about uh, what does a house look like when it's built? But the other thing that planners do that we're all passionate about is what's the village gonna look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? These big sort of master plan things, these design guidelines, that's, that's what planners really love to do, housing, things like that. That's why all of us get into planning, is to do that big 
long range planning. That's what it's called is long range planning. We still have to do the current planning. That's important too, the development projects, but there's kind of two hats in planning. Uh, so we, we do both things in planning. On the building side, what we do is we guide the construction process. So think about this as sort of a conveyor belt. The project comes in, goes through the planning process, we get the entitlements, the project's changed, whatever, so it fits with the character of the village. That's great, you've got your approval. Now you have to be able to build it. And to be able to build it, you have to go through the building permit review process where they check really specific technical things to make sure that it's built safely and up to all the standards that are, we have right now. And by doing that, we ensure the safety of the village. And lastly, we have code compliance. Uh, this is a really important thing to note that we call this code compliance, not code enforcement. There's kind of two schools of thought on code compliance and one uses enforcement and one is about compliance. We really try to seek compliance with our codes first. We're not out there you know, trying to hit people over the head with our codes and bust them every five minutes. We really want to bring people into compliance and make them understand why we do what we do so that next time they'll get there themselves. Um, so again, all customer service based kind of philosophies in these things. So we guide, we guide adherence to the city code and the code compliance division and we protect the general welfare of the village. And welfare is, is one of those really broad sweeping terms uh, that can mean many things to many people. We really just, we make it feel good to live here. That's really what we're focused on. So, next slide, please. Nancy. I know, I'm fine. <laughs> you can tell we really practice this a lot. So, so go back one for me, let's the get involved one. One more, please. Perfect. Okay, so you're gonna notice a theme. I'm really big on themes in presentations. So, we want you to get involved. And I've, I've been talking to my, my friends on the board and other members of the CRA. This whole thing that, that we do, that my team does, doesn't work unless you get involved. So I'm gonna have a little slide here, you're gonna notice a theme. How do you get involved with us? We're just down the street. Come and talk to us, send us an email. I've got people here that I've emailed with multiple times and I've put my friend here in the front row. Um, and we love it, I mean, that's why we're here. We all got into local government so we could work with the people that we're serving. So get involved. Uh, you're gonna hear this theme a lot. We have lots of public hearings and things like that. So we'll move on to the next slide and talk about state housing legislation. I'm gonna cover a wide range of state housing laws. I will do my best. Uh, go ahead, Nancy, a couple more if you would. I will do my best uh, to not get too nerdy on you. Uh, I did give a presentation similar to this at the city council. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about, next slide please, is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, or RENA. You probably heard this thrown around here recently. So RENA, what it is, it's a, a state level uh, program that sets the number of new homes that a local government must plan for. So really what it is, it's the state saying, we're going to fix the state housing crisis by telling local jurisdictions they have to facilitate the construction of a certain number of houses in a certain period of time. It doesn't mean that the city has to build them, it just means that they have to get built in that city. That's what the state is saying. So it's administered by the State Department of Housing and Community Development, also known as HCD, and it's on an eight year cycle. So we're coming up on our next eight year cycle. It's gonna be the sixth cycle of RENA. It's been around for six, eight year cycles now. Um, it breaks up the affordability of housing, low, very low, moderate. Uh, you've heard these terms thrown around. And it ties into our general plan. And for those of you that don't know what a general plan is, in land use, there's a hierarchy of regulatory documents. At the very, very top in the state of California is a thing called a general plan. It's essentially the big guiding principles. It doesn't have really specifics, like your house can only be 18 feet tall. Big, huge guiding principles that everything below it, zoning code, design guidelines, policies, they all have to be compliant with the general plan. And every jurisdiction is required by law to have a general plan, and it has to have a set number of certain elements. And that's what each section of a general plan is called, is an element. So we have a housing element in our general plan that needs to be updated in 2023 as part of the RENA process. So that's where we're going with that. So each, each region of the state is given this housing unit allocation, and I like to refer to it as a pie. So our region is pretty big. It includes like South Santa Cruz County, the entire Monterey County. The state gives us this whole pie. This whole pie, and it says, you have to take this pie of housing, and you have to spread it across your entire region. And that is, uh, that is the responsibility of our, our council of local government, our council of government, and the COG, as we like to call it. And ours is the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, or AMBAG. You've probably have heard that acronym, too. We have a lot of acronyms in our world, and I'm sorry for that. So I'll do my best not to use them. 
Um, but anyway, our, our region's cog is AMBAG, and they have to adopt a methodology to split that pie among us. So next slide, please. So our pie for the region is 33,274 units. That's across 18 jurisdictions, so it's not that many if you think about it. You know, South, South Santa Cruz County down to the, the southern tip of Monterey County, 33,000 housing units the state is saying have to be built in the next eight years, starting in 2023. So they draft this methodology, AMBAG does, and they weight certain categories. Are, you know, are they gonna put more housing in areas that have available employment or close to transit, uh, risk of natural disaster? Uh, so they, they start working through this methodology of how to split this pie up for us all to get our own slices. So uh, next, next slide, please. So this methodology uh, is applied by AMBAG and our slice right now of this pie is the third smallest in the region and it's 349 units. For some reference, you probably heard a lot of this scuttlebutt, it's gone up quite a bit since the last cycle. Our last cycle number was 62 units that we had to build in an eight year period. We're now being told that we have to build 349 units. Um, this is being felt across the entire state. It's not just us, it's not just our region. Um, there's, there's a couple that are smaller than us. The largest pie slice in our region is Salinas, as you might, you might expect, 6,600 units. Um, so this is, this is a real issue, and it's, it's an issue for twofold. One, because we're not being given much of a choice, but two, it also does represent a real problem. Housing is a real problem in California, and it's a real problem here in Carmel by the Sea. So we need to figure out how we're gonna address it. So as much as we may not like state programs that tell us everything that we have to do without, without sort of bending at all, um, there is some good, there's some good rationale behind this. We have to figure out how we try our best to meet that. So what are the next steps? So at this point, AMBAG has adopted that draft methodology. So that number that I showed you is approved by our local COG. AMBAG has approved it. That's on its way now to the state. So HCD in the next month or so will be approving or, or denying that number. They're probably gonna approve it. Then it comes back to our local level one more time for AMBAG to say, okay, good, let's go. And then what happens after that is there's an appeal period. Like any project, we all know about appeal periods. So there's an appeal period where any local jurisdiction can appeal that number. So if the Carmel by the Sea wanted to, they could appeal the 349 units we've been told we have to build in that eight year period. So if no appeals happen, then the, the, the plan is adopted in June and July. And by December of 2023, we have to update our housing element of our general plan to include that number and how we're gonna get there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but I wanna go quickly through some of these recent Senate bills. So everything in here we're talking about right now is housing based. These Senate bills are pretty recent and they were put in place to try to increase housing stock. So there's three, three pieces of legislation, SB 8, 9, and 10. Uh, in my opinion, and I've talked to a lot of my counterparts as well, there's likely gonna be little to no impact Carmel by the Sea, and there's a lot of reasons because of that, a lot of reasons for that, and I'll get to that here a little bit later. Next slide, please. So SB8, I'm gonna go over this one pretty quickly. It's an omnibus cleanup bill, which is just a fancy way of saying it's, it's a bunch of stuff dumped into one piece of paper that cleans up a bunch of small things. Um, you can see what's on the screen there, I don't have to read it to you, but it's really just about uh, you know, making sure the governments can change their mind uh, when they have housing programs in place. SB10, next slide please is a voluntary item that local jurisdictions can do. Uh, you can adopt an ordinance to increase your density, meaning you have one piece of property. Let's say right now you're only allowed to have one single family dwelling on it. You can increase that up to 10 units per lot if you have the, if you have the room for it. But this doesn't even apply to us. It doesn't even apply to us. It's not gonna happen, don't worry. This is voluntary uh, because the rezoned areas would have to be within one half mile of high quality transit. And this is, this term high quality transit is not something that I've made up. It's not a way to say whether it's good or bad. This is a real term. It talks about how frequently buses stop at stops, how many buses there are. We don't have that level of transit here in the city of Carmel by the Sea. So even if the city council decided they wanted to adopt this voluntary option, they could not. So this one doesn't really apply to us either. The big one that everyone has been talking about and has really scared a lot of people is SB9. Uh, of course, our friends at the state came up with a fancy acronym for it, the HOME Act. Uh, you can see what it stands for. It allows for up to four single family dwellings on a single family dwelling lot. So take one of our 4,000 square foot lots here. Now the state says, 
We don't, we don't know anything about you locally, but we know that every one of your lots can support four houses. <laughs> Not sure I understand that. But in their infinite, yeah, very tiny houses, Nancy, that's true. Uh, in their infinite wisdom, that's where they're at. But thankfully, unlike a little, unlike what they did recently with ADU laws, they did put some thought into uh, what I've been calling guardrails or things that would maybe preclude that from being able to happen in a jurisdiction. I'll get to those in a minute. But if you do meet the requirements for being able to subdivide a lot and put four units total, uh, it would be a ministerial action, which means there's no planning commission hearing, there's no nothing, it just happens. You can't say no. Uh, not subject to CEQA, meaning that there's no environmental review, you can't say oh, there's gonna be additional traffic or anything like that. Um, but like I said, there's numerous guardrails, so do not fear. And I'm gonna run through those really quickly for you. So one of the first ones is that we're basically a built out city. We have a few vacant lots in town. But in order to even qualify this, you can't remove more than 25% of the walls of an existing structure on the site. So that takes a lot of properties off right now because if you can't, if you can't take off more than 25% of a wall, how are you gonna find room to put more properties? Um, we can still impose our objective zoning standards, which is something that we can't do with ADUs. If you remember when the ADU laws got in place, you can't impose things like lot coverage, floor area, things like that. You can do that with SB9. So that covers us again. We can put more restrictions, it gets harder to do. Uh, it cannot be applied to certain property types, uh, historic properties and districts. We've got some of those here. Um, if you're within a whole historic district, properties that are mapped at a high risk of fire or flood, you know, the whole northeast side of town. So you slowly start chipping away at this. And there's very few places in town. I've even got more guardrails for you. Uh, next slide, please. So you can't split the lot any smaller than 4060. So if it was going to happen, it's not like you can you can take a 4,000 square foot lot and create a 500 square foot lot and a 3,500 square foot lot. It has to be evenly split, so it's actually developable. We can still require parking. You can't can, you can't get an additional ADU. Uh, the owner has to occupy it for a minimum of three years. So there's deed restrictions on these things. You can never use it as a short-term rental. And one of the things that I really like that they did, because it's, again, it's not gonna affect us, but I think that this prevents this from going sideways in bigger jurisdictions, is that the adjacent parcels cannot be subdivided by the same owner or partners of the owner. So you're not gonna get a developer that's gonna come in and buy 20 lots, scrape them, sub subdivide them, and build all these units. It's just not gonna happen. So I do wanna give the state a little bit of credit. I still don't like it when they tell us what to do, but. I want to give them a little bit of credit here because I think they put more thought into this than they did the ADU laws. Uh, the very last one, I saved this one for last because this is the death knell in my opinion. You gotta have water. I mean, <laughs> how are you, how, where are you gonna get the water around here right now? There's no water. So I think we're pretty safe here in the city of Carmel by the sea. Uh, I didn't even put anything up there on the slide, but you know, just this, the sheer cost and to make a project like that pencil to take a 4,000 square foot lot and split it, and it just doesn't make sense. Um, so that's that. The next thing, just real quickly to talk about housing. So those are the, the three recent pieces of legislation. This is just an interesting slide that I like to share with people because we are talking again about a real problem. Uh, housing is, is a real problem. Um, and we, we have a unique situation here in Carmel by the Sea uh, with, our, with our vacancy rate. Uh, you can see here in 2010, we were the sixth highest in the state and the highest vacancy rate in Monterey County. Same thing in 2021 with projected census numbers. I think. I feel like when I talk to people and when I walk around town, the general wisdom is the number might be a little bit higher than 36 or 38 um, percent. I see a lot of heads going north and south here. Um, but these are the best numbers that we have. Um, but it's certainly this is that's the lowest it possibly is. I, I would venture that it's in the 40 to 50 range. So I was just going to make a guess. But uh, next, next slide, please. So how do we solve this problem? I'm talking about problems, and that's never a good thing to do without offering some kind of solution. So. The thing about RENA and all these things where the state's pushing them down into the local jurisdictions, in the past they have been pretty lackadaisical about enforcement. They just have all these ideas so that the legislators can say, look, I passed this bill, I'm solving housing, nothing ever really happens. So recently, uh, the state has started to make it clear to us regulators that they will start regulating us much harder. And they have actually started with a couple of jurisdictions in California who um, you know, choose your favorite gesture, have given a certain gesture to the state and said, no, thank you, uh, we will not be doing anything, you can't tell us what to do. So right now, the state is at least focused on those jurisdictions, 
and it's going after them. But one, it is a real problem and we want to try to solve problems. And two, we don't want to be one of those people that, get, that gets in trouble because that means ultimately you stop being able to get funding. Uh, there's a lot of bigger things that can happen to a jurisdiction if you get in a big battle with the state. And we don't want to do that. Um, so how do we solve the problem? What we're going to do is we're going to do what's called a housing feasibility study. And uh, my staff received, applied for and received about $300,000 in grants uh, from the state. So the state, thankfully, is, is willing to give people money to do this stuff. So we have three state grants, uh, and it's an opportunity uh, to explore the barriers to building housing in our city and to try to locate some opportunity areas. Excuse me. So what does this look like? It's gonna be my staff, it's gonna be a professional firm that does things like this. It's boots on the ground, we're walking around, looking at the downtown area, looking at the residential districts, city-owned land. Um, you know, we have just an example of what this might look like. Some, some ideas might be in the downtown area. We've got buildings, we have a few two-story buildings in a row, one-story building in the middle, more two-story. Maybe we have more second stories, and we're not gonna get 350. I just don't know where we will stick 350 units in town but maybe we can maximize our mixed use a little bit in the downtown area, um, things like that. So we're gonna work with a professional company and we're gonna try to find these opportunity areas and come up with ideas of how we can incentivize building that housing. Because like I said earlier on, city can't build the housing. We, we, we just can't. Um, so we need to find a way to incentivize the right kind of housing that fits with the character of the village to be built here in the village. Uh, so that report's gonna inform how we comply with RENA and then ultimately, remember when I talked about the general plan element update, we gotta put those RENA numbers in there and we have to put in how we're gonna get there. So this housing feasibility study will then bring us back to the beginning of what I was talking about and give us the update material that we need for our general plan update. So what I've been doing over the last few months, I've been collaborating with my, my counterparts in the various peninsula jurisdictions who are all freaking out as well. And we're trying to put our heads together because you know, two, three, four, five heads is better than one. And all, all the peninsula jurisdictions, we have a lot of similarities, similarities, at least with you know housing costs and things like that. So um, we're gonna try to come up with some regional solutions, pooling our resources on you know people we've been talking to and see what we can come up with. So this is, it, it's a difficult problem to solve, but from a planner's perspective, um, remember what I talked about what we like to do, we do like to solve these kind of long range problems, but it's not gonna be easy. So that's housing feasibility study, and that takes me to my redundant slide. <laughs> How do you get involved with this? I want everybody to get involved, so please come and get involved. The housing feasibility study, there's going to be public hearings for this. We're gonna be taking public input. We're gonna do our Friday letter, we're gonna do all that stuff. We want you to get involved. The general plan update, that's a big process. There's gonna be planning commission meetings, city council meetings. It's gotta go to the coastal commission because it's part of our local coastal program. Lots of opportunities to get involved, so please, please, please get involved. Call us, ask questions anytime you want. We're here to help you. Please call us if you have questions. And those AMBAG meetings that I was talking about, those are public meetings too. Attend those, make your voices heard. We actually have, I don't know if anybody knows this, we actually have an AMBAG board member in our audience today. Our council member for Lido is on the AMBAG board. Each jurisdiction has a board member, so you have a conduit here in the city, myself, council member for Lido that you can talk to, you can go to those meetings yourself. So we, I'm gonna be really a broken record on this, but one of the things I've been trying to push in the year that I've been here is better communication with everybody in the public and trying to get you all involved because that's, that's the only way this thing works. So I'll get off my soapbox on that one, but you can hear it again soon, I promise. Uh, next thing to talk about is ADUs and JADUs. Next slide, please. So another piece of state legislation from our friends up north. This was again intended to increase housing stock. The concept is that an ADU, just by nature, it's smaller, is gonna be affordable by design. Um, and in the housing world, and in some of the stuff you've probably heard, that's a term that gets thrown around a lot, affordable by design. There's affordable by income verification, that's a low, very low, moderate, and there's a whole system. There's, like, there's, there's a regulations on land, somebody has to check um, income every year, those, th those are the things that really, really help you with your arena numbers. And then there's affordable by design, which are smaller and they're gonna be more affordable. Even in a, in a community like Carmel by the Sea, they're still gonna be expensive, but they're gonna be more affordable than the full houses that surround them. So the concept here, uh, increase the housing stock. ADUs can be up to 1,200 square feet max. Think of ADUs as 
sort of like your external uh, ADU. It's attached or it's detached, but it's really an outside thing. They, we just can't make them any smaller than 800 square feet. So they're really between 800 and 1200 square feet. A JADU, think of it as an internal. It's when you would, say, convert a bedroom in your house, you pop in an exterior door, and now you have a JADU. It doesn't have to have its own kitchen, it doesn't have to have its own bathroom. It can share facilities with the main house. It goes in and out of the house, and also has an exterior door. An ADU, completely separate, they call it an independent living facility. It's completely separate, it's on the outside. So that, that's one way to think about it. The, the tricky part about these, and I mentioned this earlier, is that when the state made these regulations, and I think it was 2016, 17, 18, they made it a ministerial process, meaning no discretion, no planning commission, no nothing. It's only a building permit. And they didn't allow us those zoning standards that I was talking about, density, coverage, floor area, all that's out the window too. So it's a lot harder to, to regulate these things. Uh, next slide, please. There are still some areas of control. Um, let's grab another drink of water, excuse me, please. There are still some areas of local control. The big ones are health and safety related. It's water, it's sewer, it's traffic, it's public safety. Most of these apply in places like the county. Like think for example in the county, they don't really have a sewer system like we do. They use septic systems. And so if you have a property where you can't expand the size of your septic system, uh, then you, you just can't get an ADU. There's very few things that can stop an ADU, but things like that can. Um, we do have some places where we can guide an ADU and sort of mold them to be a, a better part of our community. Um, that's when we start dealing with historic properties and historic districts. Uh, looking at the design, it's limited, um, but as long as we can cre uh, create some sort of uh, somewhat ministerial, meaning like a yes, no question, for what the design is. So if we can craft a language in an ordinance that is basically says the ADU has to look and feel like the main house on the property, that's kind of a yes or no test. And so we'll probably be able to get away with something like that in an ADU ordinance because it's still kind of ministerial. Um, but it's important to note that uh, you still have to have water credits. You can't just decide to put an ADU in. At this point in time, the water management district has not made the decision that ADUs or zero impact on water use. So you still have to have enough water credits to build an ADU. So that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So what has to happen? We do have, we do have regulations in our books for essential dwelling units. They're outdated. Uh, they predate all those state regulations that came out. So right now we're essentially subject to the state regulations that came in place. That's what the law said when the state came out with ADU. They said, our rules apply unless you have an ordinance that's been updated after this date. We have not done it yet. Um, to date, since 2017, only 39 ADUs have actually been approved in the city of Carmel by the sea. I don't expect you to be able to see that map. I have a much bigger version I can share later if I want to, but they're kind of, you can see where the little colors are around town. Uh, they are pretty spread out. Um, but recently at our uh, priority meeting with the city council we had in this room as well, they did prioritize drafting an ADU ordinance so we can try to wrap our hands around this a little bit. Uh, it is good timing because I'll talk in a little bit, we're gonna be uh, embarking soon on a design guideline and zoning code update. So those are on separate tracks, but related to each other. So we'll be doing that at the same time, which is nice because we can keep our minds on that. We can't necessarily regulate the ADUs directly through that process, but we can use what we do to the design and the zoning related to the main single family dwellings to guide what that question that I talked about earlier, the yes or no question of does the ADU match with the house? So we can think about that. There's, there's a way we can get there. Um, just as a side note, I wrote the ADU ordinance for the county right before I left, and so I'm pretty familiar with this stuff. Um, and I, I think we can do an even better job here um, for a couple of external factors that I, I won't discuss here, but um, I do think we can do a very good job uh, with our ADU ordinance and get, get, get a product that we would be proud of. Uh, next slide, please. Did you see that coming? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you get involved? Uh, ADU ordinance, I just talked about it. It's a public process. It goes through the planning commission. You better believe we're gonna do public workshops before we even get there. Uh, it's gonna have to go to city council because it's an ordinance and it's gonna have to go to the coastal commission. So a lot of public hearings, a lot of outreach. Um, we are, like I said, we're gonna be embarking soon on the Design Traditions Project, which is a one-year project. We're gonna be talking about ADUs a little bit, sort of interwoven in there, but there's gonna be opportunities there. 
and I'm going to make my same pitch again, just call us. Email us, come in, talk to us. We, we want to see you and want you to be part of the process. Next slide, please. The design review and planning permit process. Speaking of, next slide, please. So, this is the planning side of the house. We talked earlier at the very beginning, the three components of what we do to serve the village. We have planning, building, and co-compliance. This is the planning side of the house that I'm talking about right now. There's two basic tracks, and that's the term we use, tracks, for planning review. Um, there's a track one, which is at the staff level. Uh, they're generally at the staff level. If there's something that we feel is, is major in nature, has public controversy, we will elevate it to the planning commission so there can be a public hearing. But generally, track ones are minor projects, think fences, windows, roofing, uh, and in our code it says additions less than 10% of what's existing. So they're really small. They're not things that should in any way be changing the character of the village. It should be small enough that it's just a little bit of, of work going on. Uh, we, we still post them on our city's website. We send out notices of pending decision so people can get involved if they want to. Track two are, is a, what, the track that I think really uh, gets people the most fired up, um, to put it, put it in a certain way. This is new construction for the most part, and this has the most impacts on the village. It's a two-step public hearing process. This is in our code, this is codified right now. Uh, there's public process involved, uh, and again, those are all posted to the city's website. Um, I will note that historic properties do have additional steps and processes. We have a historic resources board. We have consultants that have to verify whether a project, a property is historic. If, if those improvements are, are in line with the Secretary of Interior standards, they kind of go off on their own track, the historic properties, because we care about them so much. Uh, they're so, such an important part, in the, part of our fabric here. So going a little deeper down the rabbit hole of the process, uh, the two-step process, we have what's called the concept hearing. This is stage one. And then we have the final details hearing. Now, originally, the concept hearing was designed in our code to really just be about uh, volume and massing and just the sticks. Like you really, initially the concept hearing, they didn't look at colors, materials, anything like that. That didn't come until the second hearing, and so there wasn't a lot of time to refine that. Um, but what we've done over the, over the recent years is modified that concept hearing so there's more of the project that's developed early on so that it can, the planning commission and the public can see it all, phase one see things like materials, colors, lighting, uh, roof materials, all that stuff. So that's the concept hearing, and that's a public hearing. No decisions are made at that hearing. I think that's a very important thing to, to say again. There's no decisions that are made at those concept hearings. It's guidance from the Planning Commission. They either say, yes, we accept this uh, preliminary design concept, or no, you missed the mark, go try again. And this is really important. We have a process right now that does work. Uh, and it works better when people get involved, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so once, once you get past that concept hearing phase, then you get to the final details hearing. This again is either the same project, or it's a project that's been refined uh, since that preliminary hearing, and that's where the decision is made. So that's the permit. That's when the planning commission approves something, and then it becomes appealable to the city council if someone wants to. So what's the staff do in this? What, is, what does my team do with respect to this design process? What they do, do is guide, suggest, inform, review, and process the application. And the reason I, I chose those words pretty carefully because none of those are uh, regulatory words. Those are all, you know, we're really trying to help an applicant through the process to get to a project. And, you know, what I tell my team is we do need to get people to yes, like we, we need to be customer service for development as well, but we need to get them to a yes that works for the village. You know, they, the thing they came in with initially we may not be able to get to yes on that, but I don't want my team, and we shouldn't, as a customer service agency, we shouldn't just say no to everything. We should say, well, this doesn't work. You should try this. And so that's what we try to do, but because of a little thing called the Permit Streamline Act, we can't tell somebody no. When they walk in with an application for a seven-story building painted zebra stripe on scenic, we can't say no to that at the staff level. When they say, as long as they give us all the information to have a project that's deemed complete, and that's a very specific term in the Permit Streamlining Act, deemed complete, meaning that there's enough information for a decision-making body, like the Planning Commission, to make a decision. So they've, they've given us all the reports and drawings and everything uh, that we need to be able to take it to the Planning Commission 
with a recommendation. So as long as it's deemed complete, we can't tell them no. We still have to take it to the planning commission, uh, which is probably why sometimes you see projects at a planning commission, and you're like, what the hell is that doing here? <laughs> That's why, because we can't tell them no. At the staff level, we can shut those little things down to staff level, and they can appeal, they can appeal that to the planning commission, or someone can appeal that decision to the planning commission. But these track two ones, the one that really, the ones that really, you know, give you the feels and really make you aware of them here in the village. We don't have that authority at the staff level. We have to process it by law. So we try our best, um, but sometimes we run into hold your hold on your pants. We run into really hard-headed developers who won't listen, despite all the years of wisdom that we have in City Hall and people that you know come and talk to us or see the designs early on. Uh, sometimes we run into hard-headed developers and we still have to take them to hearing. So we go to that concept hearing, sometimes they, they get told and sometimes they, they listen, and those are success stories. Uh, so what, what do we not do? We don't reject, we don't approve, we don't design projects, we don't modify. We, we create a balanced staff report that tells, it's supposed to tell, all sides of the story, public comments that we've received, uh, what we told the applicant along the way, what they, what they said, uh, just kind of give the planning commission <coughs> the whole story so that they, as the appropriate authority, can make their decision. It is the important thing I'm gonna highlight in the do not is design the project. I think a lot of people, not a lot, some people ask me, you know, why, why didn't you tell them that it should look like this? We can't design people's projects for them because if we start designing people's projects when they come in and then they go to a public hearing and it gets changed, you know, they come back to the city and say, well, you, you designed this, it should have got approved. And that's not, that's not what we do, that's not our job. People have their projects that they wanna to try to get through. We try to guide, suggest, inform, review them through the process. And if they wanna to listen to us, great. But ultimately the planning commission are the ones who make the decision. So I wanted to, I wanted to spend a little time on that because I think it's important. And if you're not really in the process, you may not know all that. So it's really important to talk about that stuff. Um, I think I got all of that. Nancy, go ahead and go to the next slide for me. So I wanna, share this as sort of like one of those success stories um, that I was talking about. And this, I wanna preface this whole, the next few slides. This is not a commentary on the quality of this design. I didn't put anybody's name on it. It's not a commentary on the quality of this architecture or design. Uh, it's, it's really a story about this specific site and whether or not it's appropriate. So this is a project that came to the planning staff. We worked with the applicant. We tried to guide and, and, and tell them what we thought might go better for them at the Planning Commission. Um, this specific site the, to your right, that, that's uphill, and to the left is downhill. So you can see some obvious problems right out of the gate here is that all of the, the height and the weight of the project is on the uphill side, so it's really hulking. Uh, you, you may or may not feel this is an overly modern design, uh, there's a few other kind of issues with this project. It's really busy from a roof form perspective and things like that. Um, again, not to say that it's a bad design, but given the context of where it was going, not being subordinate to the slope of the land, it was right next to a major thoroughfare. So we took it to a uh, concept theory. Having the staff already told them all these things, they, they opted to say, we're gonna roll the dice and we're gonna see what the community and the planning commission I don't know if any of you remember how this project went, but it didn't go very well. Um, so next slide, please. And so we had, a, we had an architect and a designer who was sensitive to that. They heard, they listened, they went away, and they redesigned. And so this is the same site, same exact site. You can see what they've done is they've moved the weight of the structure to the left downhill. They've completely changed the architectural style. Um, and you may still may not love this one specifically, but I think it, it's hard to argue that this isn't a better design for the village than, than the first one was, especially the specific site. So uh, I just wanna highlight this one as sort of a success story to give you a little behind the scenes of how this whole process works. Um, you know, the planning staff met on that very first one you saw. We did have these conversations. We weren't able to change their mind. We're not gonna design it for them to tell them exactly what to do. We took them to hearing, the planning commission and several members of the public came and shared their opinions. They were asked to go away and try again, and this is what they came back with, and it was uh, it was moved on from the preliminary hearing the second time. I'm just gonna go back so that people can see the previous sure. one. So that's the before. And that's the after. So, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to necessarily, you know, brag about my staff or what we do, but I think it's important um, that, that you all know that the staff really is doing their job and, and they take this stuff really seriously. 
And we, one of the things we're excited about in City Hall, and especially my department, is this upcoming project for design guidelines. Uh, because I think we're going, and don't leave that slide, that's an important one. Uh, we're, we're really excited about these design guideline updates because we have guidelines and code that we work with right now and we're pretty comfortable with, but having used them for the last 20 years, and we have a city administrator who was a planner, started as a planner, still here, he wrote some of those guidelines, so he, he and us and Nori Winter, who did this project 20 years ago, we can see the arc of, here's what we thought the guidelines and the zoning code was gonna do, here's what it's doing now, and so how can we make it better? So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but how do you get involved? Again, you're probably not surprised to see this. Planning Commission hearings, check out our website. We put, anytime a project's gonna go to the Planning Commission or HRB, we put the plans up on the website. You can go look ahead of time. You can call us and say, hey, I love this thing. Or you can say the opposite, that's fine too. Just tell us, we want you to get involved. Um, and I, I keep saying it, but come and see us. Come call us, send us an email. We wanna see you and hear from you. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, this is a big one. This is, I saved this for last, because I'm really, really excited about this project. Uh, for those of you that were here 20 years ago, there's a company called Winter & Company. Uh, they're a design firm out of Colorado, um, and they helped us with the Design Traditions Project 1. Uh, you can go on to the next slide, sorry, Nancy. You can go on to the next, uh, they helped us with Design Tradition Project 1, um, which really created the design guidelines we have right now. That company still is in existence. They're still very relevant. They're out speaking all the time. Nori Winter actually retired recently. He's the principal, but he loves Carmel and he loved the project. And so we were able to con him into coming back and working with us one more time, sort of like as a swan song project. Um, so he's gonna come, his team's gonna come, and we're gonna work with him over a 12 month period on this Design Traditions 1.5. And it seems goofy that I say 1.5, but let me explain it to you because it actually is really important. 1.5 is meant to imply that we're not throwing everything away. A 2.0 project would be 1.0 was terrible, it's going away, 2.0 is a brand new product. That's not what this is. We have pretty good bones from a design guideline and zoning code perspective. The commercial district is very light. We only have like nine pages of design guidelines for the commercial district. So we're gonna beef that up. That's probably closer to a 2.0 project. But the residential design guidelines are pretty darn good. They just need to be updated. They need to be refreshed, there's new materials, there's new methods of construction, we've got all these green energy things that we need to think about. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna refresh uh, the, the design guidelines. Um, so the zoning code and the design guidelines are gonna be done at the same time. And this is important because they're interrelated. Uh, think of the design guidelines as, as sort of, uh, not soft necessarily, as more descriptive. They use words like encouraged, or this is appropriate, or this is inappropriate. They don't have hard and fast law rules like shall and shall not and prohibited. Those rules and those languages are saved from the zoning code. But the zoning code is sort of the legal mechanism to implement those design guidelines. So they go hand in hand. The zoning code is where you find things like this is how tall the ridge of a building should be. These are the plate heights, the setbacks from different properties. Uh, so the design guidelines talk about what it looks and feels like. The zoning code is how you actually do it. So they have to be done at the same time, and that's what we're gonna do. And it's gonna be a really good opportunity to bring both into uh, the modern era at the same time. So like I mentioned, we're working with Winter and company again. Um, they remain very active. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I've got some fun pictures on here. So this is from 20 years ago. This, this is what happened 20 years ago. This was at the, the Carmel Women's Center. Um, and th this was very interactive. And this, this is what I, I foresee happening over the next year. We laid out uh, these these large pieces of paper that showed blocks. There was you know fake little houses like Monopoly houses. People were laying them out, drawing colors on things, walking around town together. And this is going to happen again. So um, I give a little credit to the city council. And I'm not just doing this because Councilmember Polito's here. When we started with this project at the beginning of the year when I first got here. We had a fifteen thousand dollar line item for staff basically to do this project and just essentially have Winter and company take a look at it and say, yeah, it looks pretty good, or you really screwed it up. That's all we could afford at the time. But city council in their wisdom said, you know, this isn't gonna be enough, and this is, this is an important enough project, we need to beef it up. So over a series of a couple meetings, we're now at about $140,000, and it's a one-year project with Winter and company coming here physically several times, managing community meetings like this, preparing documents, preparing illustrations, 
using their expertise that they have from working all over the country in communities like ours to make this a really, really great project that will hopefully last us another 10 to 20 years. So I'm really excited about this project. Uh, some of the things that are coming up soon, the council is going to be appointing a steering committee. There's gonna be a total of five members on that steering committee, each council member gets one. And this steering committee is intended to sort of be the, the closest interaction with me and my team and the, and the consultant. Um, we're gonna meet about once a month. Now, those, those steering committee will also be asked to be part of every single community workshop like this, all the planning commission hearings, and all of the city council meetings. So there's a lot of public outreach that's gonna happen, and there's a lot of, gonna be a lot of opportunity for everyone to get involved, I keep saying it. So, you can see all the public hearings and public workshops we're gonna have. The process is really designed to bring the residents along, and that's what we talked about with the city council at the several meetings we had, is the only way this works, and the only way that it really does what the village wants it to do is that if everyone gets involved. And you're probably noticing the theme now. So Design Traditions 1.5 is intended to serve the village, and I hope that's really what it does. So we're looking forward to more of these things. I think we'll probably have some more digital components uh, this time around, but there's definitely gonna be some pencil and paper, and there's gonna be some real hands-on opportunities for anybody that wants to get involved. Uh, next slide, please. So what's, what's the timeline on this? We got the contract approved in March, uh, we've already started working with Winter and Company. Uh, we're developing just sort of like the rough schedule, some early documents, some PowerPoints. Uh, April 5th is when the City Council will appoint that steering committee. And then the following week is the first week that Winter and Company will be here. Three day, three day visit with uh, my team and the steering committee. We're gonna be out walking the streets. The great thing about working with Winter and Company is I, I pulled those pictures from a Dropbox that we share with them. They have all of their pictures and all of their documents and all of their, everything from 20 years ago. So we can go walk around town, take the pictures they took of you know, a certain corner or a certain street 20 years ago before they did the design guidelines. They said, we, we're gonna do this because we wanna make sure this happens or stays this way. We can look 20 years later and say, well, did that work? We can actually see that because we're using the same people. It's one of the huge benefits of using these guys again. So that's that first trip that we're gonna do with Winter and Company, it'll be three days, mostly with staff. Um, and then they're gonna go back and, and do a little bit of assessment uh, then they're going to come back in June for our first in-person community workshop. So we'll do it like you saw in the pictures. We'll do something like that in June. Uh, July, uh, they're going to review that input and refine the strategy. And August is when they're going to come back again. And at that point, it'll be sort of confirming the direction of where we want to go. That's you know, sort of the 30,000 foot level. This is what we've heard over the last few months. This is what we saw. Are we on the right track? And they're not asking me, and they're not asking the city council. They're coming to ask the community. This is gonna be a question to you all. Are we on the right track? So after they come and we have that conversation, then they'll go back and they'll start drafting. They'll start writing, making these illustrations, working with us, uh, and then we'll come back and get a look at those. And again, you can see this is not unintentional. They're gonna present the drafts to the community. Of course, the city council and the planning commission and my team are all gonna be involved too. This is a community presentation. So they're gonna come back in November and do that. Um, December, I'm clearly not good with calendars because I have January 22, after we've already gone through the full year of 2022. How about 2023? Nobody that, but yeah, thanks. Definitely should have been 2023. Um, anyway, so January, December, January, we'll get a second draft after the community provides input on that first draft. And then February, March is when we'll actually get into those hearings. Remember, decision-making hearings versus not decision-making hearings. Those will be the decision-making hearings, February and March, by the Planning Commission and City Council. Now, because all these design guidelines and everything are part of our LCP, Local Coastal Program, that ultimately have to get approved by the Coastal Commission that they're consistent with our LCP, that's after this. Um, and so we'll, at some point in this process, we will bring our friends from the Coastal Commission into the process they're not gonna to get too concerned about this because it's more about design, less about access. The Coastal Commission really cares about providing access to the public. Um, but we always, it's always a good idea. I've had a lot of success with this in the past at other places I've worked. Um, I have a good relationship with Coastal Commission staff. If you bring them in early in on the process, let them know what you're doing, you're a lot less likely to run into problems on the back end. So somewhere in there, we'll fold them in, but I'm not too concerned about it because we're not really dealing with access. Um, so next slide. Surprise, surprise. So, how can you get involved with this part of what we're doing? Come to City Council on April 5th. That's the steering committee. That's only like a week away. 
participate in those public workshops that I talked about. There's gonna be a lot of them. We're gonna advertise the heck out of them, I promise. Uh, participate in those public hearings, the decision-making hearings, and come and talk to us anytime. I really truly mean that. You know, I, I was telling you know, some folks earlier when everyone was coming in, one of my favorite parts about being here last year is just getting to meet people and get to know them. Um, it's such a great community, and I think that that's such an important part of, of how we do this together is getting to know each other. So I'm, I'm sincere about that. I'll, I'll walk with you and have coffee, just walk and talk. Um, we can talk on the phone. I'm here. Please come talk to me. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I got more ideas for you to get involved. Uh, one of the things that I did right after I started here is I set up this uh, constant contact on our homepage. So this, this is a picture of our homepage. So if you go to the City of Carmel by the Sea homepage and you click on this button right here, it says sign me up. Uh, you'll be taken to that sheet on the right hand side there. All you give us is your email address and uh, your first name. And the list goes way down. I didn't put the whole list up there, but there's all kinds of interesting topics on there. And we can put whatever topic on there you want. You can sign up for all the city council agendas, the planning commission agendas, the Friday letter, which I highly recommend that you all sign up for that. Not so you can watch Chip and I act like idiots for five <laughs> minutes on a video. We just do that for ourselves, it's very fun. Um, but so you can read the updates that we put up there. So there's some really helpful updates that come through there. And that's how we, that's how we wanna communicate with the community. So, Go in there, sign up for the Friday letter. There's specific projects on there. You can sign up for updates on the past or projects. Uh, paid parking is on there. And obviously, as we start working on these design tradition projects, we're gonna have all kinds of great updates coming through there. So go sign up on our website. We don't share that with anybody. That's totally internal. There's no spam or anything that's gonna come from that. It's just from us. Uh, next slide, please. Another way for you to get involved, call or email us. We actually do like to talk to people, believe it or not. Um, this is, this is a snapshot from our website. All of our contact information is up there, phone numbers, emails. Uh, that's no problem. Call us anytime. And next slide, please. Or, it's not that big of a village. Just come and say hello. You know where we're at. Um, come down and say hi to us, and we'll be happy to talk to you. So um, with that, I will end my babbling in just under an hour. Hope you guys can fall asleep during that. Um, and I'm open for questions if anybody wants to talk about anything. So 
Um, the thing about a project like that, they've already done one EIR, which is an environmental impact report. Can you speak with the top of your throat? Oh, yeah, so we're talking about the, the proposed lights up at the, the Carmel High School. Um, they, they've already done one EIR, which is an environmental impact report. That's under the world of CEQA, which I could talk a long time about and bore you to death, but I won't. Uh, long story short, that's the highest level of environmental review that you can do. Uh, it's a long process. It costs, it costs them about one hundred and thirty or $140,000 to prepare the document. It gets publicly circulated. There's comment periods, and then they have to decide whether or not they can adopt it. What they've done is they've said, we're going to do another one. So they're going to do a second EIR. CEQA is all about public process. That's why CEQA was created in the 70s, is so that there was public notice for impacts to the environment. So getting back to my ad nauseum theme, if you want to get involved with that, keep your eyes out. Uh, we are a, uh, a sister jurisdiction and we're in the sphere of influence, so we do get a copy of the EIR sent to us when it comes out. Uh, we can put it up on our website so that anybody can see it. It's a public comment period, so you can comment on the EIR, you can go to the hearings. Uh, it's not in our jurisdictions. We have zero decision-making power on it, but we can influence it as a city. So keep your eyes out for that, and when we see the EIR come out, we'll post it on the website. Ultimately, how was the decision made to pass it or turn it down? Who <coughs> makes the decision and how big is that body? For the lights? Mm -hmm. It's County of Monterey. So well, it'll be the Planning no, Commission. Who? Who? Like, What's seven individuals on the county commission what oh so the planning commission for county of monterey is 10 people there's 10 planning commissioners and then the city uh, board of supervisors is five so do they all vote and their vote is final yeah so their their planning commission functions just like our setup uh, planning commission is a is a uh, sort of like a standard regulatory body that any jurisdiction has to have so they function just like ours as a public hearing they make decisions they make findings a resolution and their decision is final unless it's appealed within an appeal period. So it's a straight up and up or down vote. That's right. Those 15, is that right? A 10, so the planning commission is first, the planning commission is 10 people, okay. and then <laughs> if the planning commission decision is appealed, that's appealed up to the board of supervisors, which is akin to our city council. So and we have planning commission, city council, is board of supervisors five? is five, okay. planning commission is 10. Each board of supervisor appoints two planning commissioners in the county. So that's who she would like to talk to. Absolutely. About. Okay. Yeah. Hi, sure. Hi. Um, I have two questions about the ADU. Mm -hmm. Is there any a required off-street parking for ADU? That's a great like question. First question. Okay. And second is what's the maximum square footage coverage uh, on a 4,000 square foot lot? So okay, so I'll repeat those two questions. So the first question was, is there what are the what are the, basically what are the parking requirements uh, when you have ADUs? And the second question is, what's what's the maximum coverage allowed on a, a single family lot? Um, and so I'll answer the first question first. The parking requirements for an ADU, uh, if you're converting a garage, for example, you don't have to replace that parking. This is for an ADU. Remember I talked a little bit about ADU versus JADU. JADU, think of internal. ADU, think of external. So for JADUs, you are required to provide parking, and they do count towards site coverage. They're, they're, they're not as... Um, hands off as an ADU is. Uh, but for an ADU, you don't have to replace the parking, you don't have to provide parking, so if you were to build an ADU, you don't have to provide parking for that second unit. You still just have your one parking space that you're required to have under our code. As far as the site coverage, um, are you, you're asking about, we can't control ADUs based on the site coverage. So if, if you have a 4,000 square foot lot, uh, you have a 1,600 square foot house, if you can jam an 800 square foot ADU in there, you can do it. We can't say no to that. And what about trees? Uh, well, they can't, so that's a good question. So, um, so Nancy asked about trees. Uh, they can, you, you don't get a free pass at cutting down trees. That, that's not something you can do with an ADU. So, but if the, if the maximum ADU is 1,200 mm -hmm. square feet, somebody has the water credits and all of that, they yep. don't have to do additional parking, and then, so they can do 1,200 on top Well, it'd be 3,000 square feet of, of two homes, basically, because yeah, an ADU is separate. But yes, that's correct. But if you, if you remember what I said earlier, the, the minimum we can regulate to is 800 square feet. So once we have our ADU ordinance in place, because we have such small lots and because of the trees, you can put things in there that says, we, 
here's why we're unique and we can't absorb any bigger than 800 square feet. So that's my goal and intention is to write an AV ordinance that limits it to 800 square feet. Nice. Right now we're operating under state law and so it is 1200 square foot max. It'd be very challenging to cram 1200 extra square feet onto a property anywhere in town right now, but um, yeah. But 800 square feet is a minimum. We can't make it any smaller than that. So we, we can't regulate down below 800 square feet. So we can say in our ordinance, you can't have any bigger than 800 square feet. We can't, we could never say, you can't have any bigger than 650 square feet. 800 feet is sort of that line that we can't cross as regulators. 800 square feet is considered a state, uh, a state exempt ADU. So we, we're totally hands off on 800 square feet. But just to be clear, You could choose to do that. You could, you could okay. choose, absolutely. We just can't tell you you have to make it 600 feet or smaller. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So the question was, sorry, I keep forgetting to repeat. The question was, one, um, can someone build smaller than 800 square feet if they choose to of their own volition? And the answer is yes, yeah. you absolutely can. What's the water district doing about this, this issue? Anything, are they discussing this? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, you know, one of our planning commissioner commissioners uh, is involved with water very heavily. Um, I, I worked with them a lot when I was at the county. At this point, like I said earlier, they, they, they're not looking at an ADU as a no impact situation. So you do have to have the water credits. Now, you don't have to put a new meter in. So this is the difference, right? If you're gonna build a second or a new home, you have to put in a water meter and it's a new connection. And as we all know, there's a moratorium right now on connections because of the, the Carmel River. Um, but ADUs don't fall under that. You just have to have enough water credits. So if you can convert some really inefficient facilities or you happen to have water credits floating around or you happen to buy an El Paso water when it was for sale, then you can do it. Um, but as of right now, they're still requiring you to have water. There has been some conversations over the last couple of years uh, in our jurisdiction and in others that you know water management districts might say to help move the ball forward on building ADUs, we're gonna say, there's no impact, whatever water you have is okay to build an ADU. That hasn't happened yet here. I don't think there's anything on the table right now, um, but that has come up a couple times. Um, I'm just very delighted that we will have uh, many opportunities to get involved. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, you caught that. Yeah, I caught nice that. job, Carol. <laughs> there's no prize, I'm sorry. But Thank you, you, you for that, and Karen also had a role in that. And, um, um, Mike Brown made me promise to bring up uh, Picasso, mm -hmm. uh, which is like a timeshare of I'm not sorts. a fan of his art, but okay. Uh, <laughs> so can you kind of talk about that and sure. what we're gonna do about it? I can talk about it very little. Um, what I can tell you is that we are currently working with a city attorney. Um, so, so the question was about Picasso. And it, it, anybody that doesn't know what or who Picasso is, uh, think of timeshare, but maybe not. So what they do is Picasso is a company they buy a property, a very expensive high-end property, places like Carmel by the Sea, the Highlands, Napa. The company, Picasso, buys it. They're, nation, they're worldwide, by the way. They're an international company. They buy this property. They buy it under an LLC. So the, an LLC is really buying this property. And then what Picasso does is they put this LLC up for sale fractionally. So you can buy one-eighth of an LLC. So while it's up there for sale, Picasso owns eight shares of an LLC. And as they slowly sell off each of the shares, they lose their shares in the LLC. Eventually, eight different people or whoever own this one piece of property via the LLC. And so it's a slightly different model than your typical timeshare. There are a lot of things about it that function the same way. There's a calendar uh, that, that Picasso manages the site. They're limited to no more than 44 days per year. They can't stay there more than 14 days in a row. So when you start adding all that up, it kind of smells and feels and quacks like a duck, you know? And so what we've been doing is we're working, and this is why I can't talk much more about it. I'm just telling you what Picasso is. We're working with our city attorney. We have been having conversations um, with our council as well, uh, what, what we're going to do and what we can do. Um, so we should have some updates coming out pretty soon for everyone that will tell you, but rest assured, we are looking into it and seeing what we can do uh, with respect to Picasso. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question about this issue. When, when we went switch to volume metrics and mm -hmm. you know, for now, the four-story house to look alike. 
you know, it, it's like music to my ears. I, I love what you're saying. It right just yeah. it drove me back. So I lived yep. here for 30 years. I wanted to build a one in 12 to one in 15 mm -hmm. roof, and it had been outlawed by volumetrics. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. And every house looks the same, mm -hmm. and everybody's taste changes in this village. I mean, what you like and you like and I like probably have nothing in common. Mm -hmm. But I sort of feel everyone has their right to do <coughs> things within limits. But volumetrics speak to a choice of way. Are so, we going to address this? So the question is uh, about volumetrics. And it sounds like a very fancy word, but basically what it is is how big is something. Um, so in our, in our process, in our, the planning process I walked through earlier, and this is in our code and our design guidelines, there's a thing called the volume study. And what that does is basically it's a mathematical equation uh, where you take a house, the box, and the roof, and any appurtenances that's living space, and you add it all up, and we have limits for the volume that you can have for a house. And the reason that this was put in originally, 20 years ago, was because we wanted to prevent these massive, huge, bloated houses. Um, and But the formula that was used is pretty darn complicated. And what ends up happening is there's really only two or three roof pitches that allow somebody to max out. So this is where it, this is where it happens. It, it allows people to max out their development footprint because there's a couple of roof pitches that make the volume such that you can get the biggest amount of floor space. So it has, it has put a bit of a damper on creativity for steep, steep roofs, you know, varied roof pitches and things like that. So absolutely, that was one of the first things I put on my list when I started going through this was, we need to look at volumetrics. I still think it's important but I think we need to look at the standards of how we do it. Keeping in mind the purpose of why we did it so we don't have these big bloated homes, but is there a way we can do it better and sort of guide people towards thinking create more creatively about roof pitches and forms and things like that. So we're absolutely thinking about it. I mean, even a, a design exception guideline, in other words, people say this, this design warrants a variant. Mm -hmm. You know, because I understand the reason behind it. Yep. But it, I'm sorry. Oh, you, it, don't, you don't have to apologize, I can't. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your words, not mine. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, I, you know, the SB10 talked about having trans, you know, transportation mm -hmm. hub, and why wouldn't we consider the Beacon North Park where all the buses reach? You know, come and go, be a yep. transportation hub, so that therefore we would have to provide that um, additional housing. In the yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the question was about that SB10. It was one of the three regulations that I talked about, SB8, 9, and 10. So SB10, if you remember, was the voluntary one that a city can do. You can adopt an ordinance to increase the density of your zoning, going from only allowing one single family residence on a piece of property to up to 10, if you have the room for it, obviously. But one of the things that disqualifies us right now from that is not having that high quality transit. And, uh, and the high quality transit is not a knock on you know, how clean the bus is or how nice the bus driver is. It's really, it's really a, a scientific term that talks about how frequently the bus comes, the size of the buses, the number of routes and things like that. So you, it's, it's like a grade that you get for transportation systems. Um, so we currently do not have what's considered by um, MST high quality transit. Now, Maybe that changes in the future, but all that would do is give the city council the opportunity to decide whether or not they wanted to adopt an ordinance to increase the density from one to one to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They can they can choose. Um, so that's all that would do. That's all that would change. Would just give the city council the ability to make that decision. On the back here, you gotta raise your hand, man. And just stand up. Yeah, 349. 349. Yep. Mm -hmm. But there's no issue of water. Absolutely. So how is that going to work? You're, you're a natural born planner. I love it. <laughs> this, is, this, is the, this is the head scratcher that we have too. And it's, it's, it's even deeper than water. So when the state comes forward with these well-intentioned pieces of legislation, it, it's done as a one size fits all. You know, they're thinking places, you know, like downtown Sacramento, like they've got you know, more resources. They're not thinking about places where you've got crazy topography, lots of trees, historic buildings, yeah. water moratoriums, things like that. So it's a great question. I don't really have an answer for you. I mean, we, we have to figure out 
at least get to the, those first couple stages of doing that feasibility study and making a plan and see if we can make it come true. Uh, at some point, the state's gonna have to do something to help with the water, because it's just a real problem. So just to follow up, so AMBAG made all the, distributed all the Correct. Uh, portions of housing in the different from the Santa Cruz County or Southern yeah. Park yep. down. Mm -hmm. Did they, is that, do, are they also considering the water? I mean, are there other places that have more water than here? I don't really know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. So the question was, is anybody, are there any other parts of our region, the region that AMBAG, remember back to all my acronym, our COG, AMBAG, who split up the pie for us. Is there any other regions, any of the jurisdictions in our region that have more water than we do? And I think the short answer is no. I mean, California in general has a water problem. Um, and AMBAG, they, you know, they certainly made the comment like, like everybody did, said this is a huge number going from 10,000 to 33,000, but there's nothing they can do about it either. They're just given a, a pie that they can't return and they have to split it up, so um, yeah. Comment. Um, it seems that one of the reasons it sort of tripled was that now they have to consider overcrowding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question was: It seems it seems that perhaps one of the reasons it's almost tripled is because they're trying to accommodate for overcrowding. Um, and I think that's true. I think you know some of the other conventional wisdom that's out there is they're trying to make up for deficient numbers in the past. I mean, maybe their their arena in the past wasn't enough, and so now they're trying to play catch up, which. Just because you forgot to put you know, 10 gallons into a five gallon bucket doesn't mean you can pour it in there now just because you forgot about it. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's a little bit of catch up, it's a little bit of uh, trying to make up for this overcrowding situation that we have. I want, I, I, Graham did try to speak, so I, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Graham Norton. Uh, thank you, uh, a very good presentation. And uh, you've answered a lot of my questions anyhow. And I'm sure my question is probably known by vast majority of people here. But for the uninitiated, how are the, how is the commission comprised? How does it how is it created? Who are they? Our planning commission? Yes. So the, that's a great question, and that's very topical. I did not ask him to, to say this. So right now, uh, <laughs> there's open applications for all of our boards and commissions here in the city. Planning commission, historic resources board. Forest and Beach Commission. There are people, there are members on all these boards that their terms come up and they can either choose to reapply or they can just be done. And so you have to apply. You apply with the city, you apply through the city clerk, and then ultimately it's it's the members of the city council who appoint people who have applied. They look at, uh, at it's sort of like your curriculum vitae, your, your, your resume, your, you know, what are you gonna bring to the table, your specialties, and then they, they appoint people. So it's an appointed position. It's not a public election or anything like that, but you do have to apply to the city. Right, so, so it's an employee position. Uh, it's probably better to call it a volunteer position. You're welcome. Um, let's see, over here. Who chooses the planning commissioners? The, the city council. So I'm wondering if we've ever considered term limits. They have term limits. Uh, so they, their terms are, and it's up on our website, um, and if I had that I would show you, but if you go to each of the uh, commission's home pages, uh, you can see when each of the members' terms expire. And so they, they're on, uh, I think it's two or four year cycles, I can't remember off the top of my head, but each of them has an expiration date, and when that expiration, expiration date comes up, they're, just like anybody else, is able to reapply if they want. Uh, and then the city council members can decide whether or not to reappoint them. It, it seems, um, it feels like perhaps we should talk about a, a one time period of four years and then you're done mm -hmm. so that we get fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, it's, I, I've, heard, I've, heard both, I've heard both points on this. Um, I've heard people say that so you get fresh blood. Um, and I think that the counterpoint to that that I've heard from people is the longer you have a planning commissioner on there or a historic resources board, as long as they're effective and they're doing a good job, they're becoming more knowledgeable about the code, more entrenched with the community, 
they have some continuity with past projects so they can think back to old decisions and have some some of that continuity that's so important. So there's definitely two schools of thought on that, but like anything we do here, it's a public process. So these appointments will be done uh, at the city council. There'll be a conversation about it. So it'd be a perfect time to come and make those comments if you'd like to. It's okay. Look at you. Okay. Who's next? Anybody? these goals with smaller units because for 30 years we had a rental that was like 260 versus 278 mm -hmm. depending on whether you counted the outside porch which at various times was included wasn't mm -hmm. and each time it came up for rent there was a stampede for it it was also the cheapest place for rent yeah. but people were thrilled and you know Unless they got transferred, they stayed. I, yeah, the question was, can we meet our housing goals with smaller units? I think the, the partial answer is yes. I still don't know if 350 is achievable because don't forget, we still have leftover from our last cycle. Uh, we still got about 60 left from that cycle, so it's actually bigger than 350. Yeah, but I mean, um, you could easily meet 20 or 30. Yeah, sure, so like I, I, do think, I do think that the, the partial answer is yes. Um, and and that's, that's sort of the concept behind doing that feasibility study is going to look where those opportunity areas are. Are we looking at... You know, second stories in the commercial district, which by nature are going to be smaller because they're kind of a mixed use development. Um, so I think absolutely yes, that's a great way to approach it. I don't know if we'll ever be fully be able to achieve that 350 plus 60 number, but we're going to do our best. You know, um, it seems that one of the reasons uh, Carmel got more assignment was that we have a jobs ratio too. That the jobs. So we have a lot of people who work in Carmel, but live out in Marina or Seaside or Salina. So it's mm -hmm. an attempt also to put housing where the jobs are. Yep. So it's, it's all a balance. Yeah, that would, if you remember I did put up, so they had some weighted numbers up there. there when we first went through this with AMBAG um, in the last few months, we started actually about 140 units. Uh, then there was some some recalculations of how to do it. There was some uh, some some input from the public and uh, looking at also things like income and some social engineering things. That number went up to 350 uh, from 140. Um, but yeah, how, where, where the jobs are, that's a big part of it. Transportation's part of it. The the, the environmental hazards, you know, fires, flooding, uh, erosion, things like that, it all plays into it. And greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases. Thank you, Councilor Member. Okay, can I take, I got one more hand up. What's the consequence to the city of Carmel of not meeting the goal of 350? That's a great question. So I was I was kind of, you know, tongue in cheeking that a little bit that, you know, there's there's other jurisdictions in the state that are giving the, the middle finger um, and they are, the state is coming after them now. They didn't used to. And so we do know that the state is taking enforcement more seriously. I have talked to you know, some of my other counterparts. I have some contacts at the state HCD, uh, at AMBAG. At least for the foreseeable future, as long as you're doing your best, and you're really making productive efforts, things like our feasibility study, and building some of these smaller units, like we won't get to 350 plus 60, but I think we're gonna be pretty safe as long as we're actually making an effort. Um, I, I, I don't get the sense that the city has any desire to thumb their nose at the state. I think all five city council members recognize that we need housing, and that it's very important, so we, we are gonna charge forward with that and do the, the noble best that we can. Weird question. Is there any way to put 350 doors on these people's garages? So <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's weird, I know. If you wanna live in a garage, maybe. I've done it before, that's <laughs> I, know, I know. No, but I mean, all joking aside, I think this is this is where a solution to a massive problem like this is going to have to come from. Maybe not doors on garages, but like really thinking of stuff that hasn't been thought of before. And this is why we're reaching out to our, our sister jurisdictions around the peninsula to try to pool our mental resources. So if any of you come up with an idea of how to solve this housing problem, reach out to me, please. I would be very appreciative. All right. Okay, thank you everybody.